Well, good morning, folks. Everybody hear me okay down the back there? If I'm too loud, you need to move away from the speaker. There's an extra speaker down the back, so nobody should, uh, everybody should be able to hear me uh, okay today. It's good. It's good to see so many gathered out. It's good to hear that buzz of everybody chatting together. Um, that's one of the, the beauties, I think, of having everybody in the one hall, as we know. It's, it's good to, to get to know each other. It's good to chat together. Uh, and this affords us uh, that opportunity. But you're all uh, very welcome to our service here this morning. But you know what I'm going to do? Can you guess what I'm going to do? Well, I've welcomed you. So stand up. And welcome each other. Say hello to whoever's beside you, behind you. See, isn't that buzz and chatter just a wonderful thing? Uh, and long may it, long may it continue. It's good. It's, it's good to, to talk to each other. It's good to welcome each other. It's good to be here and be part of God's family and the endowment as we meet uh, to worship God. Uh, this morning, uh, our flowers have been put on by Stephen and Greta Austin. Uh, and of course, we welcome those listening uh, to the morning service uh, by means of well, either CD or internet ministry. Uh, you'll have received a copy of the announcement sheet uh, on the way in. As you will have already noticed, there are loads of things going on here on the sheet, loads of things uh, for you to read. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, I'll leave the most of them with you. Just a few things uh, I do want to highlight. On the back of your sheet, there's two announcements worthy of note. Uh, the choir and praise group social evening, uh, you'll see there in the Everglades this Tuesday at 6 p.m., not 6.30 p.m. Uh, if you come uh, at 6.30 p.m., I'll have all the dinner at. Um, so meeting at 6 p.m. in the Everglades, if you're coming along to that meal. And of course, uh, if you're a member of the congregation and would like to come along uh, to that evening, uh, speak to, to Bertha, I'm sure you'd be made more than, than welcome uh, to come along uh, to that evening. The bottom announcement then, uh, there's an announcement that all members of the congregation uh, are invited to uh, the service of installation uh, for the Reverend Knox Jones in Achidui Presbyterian Church on the 13th of December uh, at 7.30 p.m. If you don't know where Achidui Presbyterian Church is, just go into your sat-nav or Google and put in God's country, uh, and that'll take you straight there. So, well... Um, a couple of other just in the, the center of the announcements, uh, you'll see uh, the Congregational Family Christmas Dinner and Party Night is on the 14th of December at 5 p.m. here in the hall. Uh, the cost is £15 for adult and £5 for children, uh, and you'll see we've decided there. Any family wishing to come along, um, you'll pay a maximum of £40. Two adults, two children, and, and that's it. Um, the sheets are in the vestibule there if you want to put uh, your name to them to give us some idea of numbers. Herbie needs to know how many turkeys to kill out the back. Um, but uh, the, the, the sheets are there. Uh, please put your name on them. One last announcement. Um, you'll know uh, we have been talking about fundraising. There was a fundraising meeting uh, last week and there's an announcement there uh, in the middle and I hope I haven't offended anybody by saying carrying too much weight. Uh, but if you're carrying too much weight, uh, we mean in your pockets. And we, this time of year and coming into the new year, you'll see all these wonderful diets and stuff. So we want to help you lose a pound a week. Um, and you'll see a big bottle in the, the, the entrance hall on the way in as well there on the way out. It just says one pound jar on it. That's Glendermott diet jar. That's where you lose your pound a week. Um, what did I call ourselves? Glendermott Presbyterian Pocket Pinchers. So we're looking to pinch a pound out of your pocket every week and put it in the jar. A pound a week is easy found. A pound a week, was, I mean, a Mars bar costs you nearly a pound these days. Um, I don't know, I wouldn't eat such rubbish, of course, but um, it's very easy found. Uh, and you know, we have a very important project going on across the way. Uh, so we want everybody uh, to come together and unite and to support that. Uh, so something we'd like you to consider uh, and to commit to 
uh, just a little bit extra uh, would, would help us uh, along the way. I leave the rest of the announcements with you, uh, and this truly is my, my last announcement. It's uh, with pleasure uh, we announce we want to congratulate uh, our BB captain Stephen uh, and his wife Elaine on the birth of new baby Lydia during the week there. So another baby into the congregation. It's always nice to uh, to have good news uh, and happy news. And so we trust that they will know God's blessing in the days uh, that lie ahead. As we come uh, to, to worship, uh, I want to, to read a few verses. I'm sure I have read these before, um, but we come to focus on Christ. We come to worship uh, Christ uh, together, we, so it's good for us to, to focus on that from the very outset. So I want to read a few verses uh, from uh, Paul's letter to uh, the Colossians, uh, the supremacy of the Son of God. It's entitled here, Colossians 1, reading from verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is ahead of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Christ is in and over all things, and that should certainly lead us to praise and to worship him. We're going to stand, we're going to sing our first piece of praise. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Let's stand and let's sing this together.
just apologize to the choir. I don't know where the hymn sheets are today. Um, as you see, I've got a creak in my neck as well. But um, listen, let's, uh, let, let's commit our time to God in prayer together. Let's, let's join in prayer. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for this wonderful opportunity to meet in fellowship and friendship as your people here in this place. Father, we thank you for the wonder that it is that we sinful human beings can come and gather in your name, Lord, to sing our songs of worship and to approach your mighty throne of grace and prayer. Lord, what an awesome privilege that is for us. Lord, we come to proclaim you as the king of all creation. Lord, as we have just sung, you are uh, and read from your word, you are in everything, you are over everything, you created everything. And Lord, surely that, as we ponder those words, should rise up within us in praise and worship to you. Lord, help us in this time of worship together to come. Lord, to focus on you. Lord, to give everything uh, that we are and everything that we have to you in, in this time of worship today. Lord, we pray that you would be the focus of all things here uh, today. And yet, Lord, we know and have to confess that as we come uh, to worship here and as we gather, yes, even in, in this, your house together and in this gathering of your people together, Lord, we might easily say that we come in your name and to worship you, but Lord, our hearts can be so far from you. Lord, our focus is elsewhere. Lord, we worry about things that have happened in the the week past. We worry about things that will happen in the week to come. Lord, we get so engrossed in our worldly lives that Lord, we allow them to to interfere as such with a sense of worship here today. So Lord, we, we come today and just simply have to confess our, our shortfalls. But Lord, we know we come to a, a forgiving God. We know we come to a God who loves us and cares for us. A God who is willing to forgive us even, even when we fall so short of what you expect of us. So, Lord, that is our simple prayer today. Will you forgive us? But will you help us? Help us to worship you rightly. Help us to worship you as you deserve. Help us to come, Lord, in humility and thanksgiving for all that you are and all that you've done for us. Lord, inspire us and enthuse us in this time that we set aside to come to you. And, Lord, to to sing our praise from the very depths of our hearts. So will you lead us and guide us in this time we commit it to you. We do so in the confidence we have because we come in and through the wonderful name of our Saviour Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn to God's word uh, together once again. We're going to read uh, that same passage that we we read last week, Philippians 1. no, not Philippians 1. I have wrote the note. Philippians 2, verses 1 to 11. Imitating Christ's humility, uh, it's entitled in, in my Bible. If you're following in one of the Pew Bibles, it's found on page 1179. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, reading verse from verse 1 through uh, to 11. This is God's word. Let's, uh, let's listen to it uh, together. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing 
by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. We thank God for his word, and we trust that he will speak to us through it when we turn to it. As we gather later on, do young folk want to come to the front? Uh, and I'll come down off my big platform here, and we'll have a word. Come on ahead, come on up, and we'll... Come on up, I'm not that scary. Come on. That's about as close as you can come. Good man. It just lets everybody it lets everybody in you see when you come further forward. How are we doing today? Good. Good? We all happy? I know one boy's happy anyway. Because you know what's coming, don't you? Well we well, we just got a bit of a mess today, will we? No, you've been waiting for this. The birthday box. I wonder, is it anybody's birthday today? You're a bit quieter now than you were a minute ago. (laughs) Oh, we get the birthday box. Any other birthdays? Over there. There we go. Two birthdays today. We had no birthdays for a long time, and now we have two birthdays all in the one day. You going to reach up or you want to look in and see? Ladies first. (laughs) <laughs> Have you a wee look and see what you'd like? Uh, it's not easy to choose, sure it's not. <gasps> there, pretty. But- would you like a pretty butterfly as well? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Happy birthday to you both! Did you have, a- have you had a big party yet? You have a big cake? He's, he's getting yeah. his birthday today at Nanny's. You're having your birthday today at Nanny's? So we all invited for a party then? Yeah. They have a big bit of cake? Yeah. No? No cake for the minister? Yeah. That's terrible. What are we going to talk about now? <gasps> you see, today, I thought today I would bring a friend with me. Hmm? Do you ever bring a friend to church? No. No? Well, my mum and daddy are the friends. Your mum and daddy's your friend. That's good to hear. That's very good to hear. Your mum and daddy's your friend. Of course they are. Well, I thought today I would bring a very special friend of mine with me. And his name is Billy. And I'm sure you have met Billy somewhere along the way before. He's in my pocket. He's only a wee tiny friend. No, not Billy the goat. Close. Billy the balloon. You ever meet Billy the balloon before? No. No? Look. See the big smile on his face. Billy is really, Billy is really happy to be here. But you know, Billy has a problem. And it's a problem a lot of people have. Billy just loves himself. (laughs) Billy thinks he is the greatest greatest thing. You ever hear the saying, best things in sliced bread? Billy just thinks he is brilliant at everything. But you know, that's not even really the problem. He thinks he's brilliant at everything, but he just loves telling everybody that he's so brilliant. And you know what happens when you boast like that there? You see, Billy thinks, and he'll tell you that he is just really brilliant at, he's the best in school at, what was, he's dead. (laughs) (laughs) There we are. (laughs) He's not dead now. (laughs) He just ran out of puff. 
He's, that, that happens to you when you get a wee bit older. You're only to puff very easily. But do you see when he, when he talks about himself, do you ever really boast about something you've done? Did anybody ever tell you if you boast about something anymore, your head's going to be that big you wouldn't get out through the door? Yeah. Sometimes we talk like that when we talk about ourselves, and that's Billy's problem. Billy's head's a wee bit skew off here. His face just didn't come as I thought it would. But you see, you know what happens when we boast about things? You say, Billy, he thinks he's, he's the best in school at football out in the playground and his head gets a wee bit bigger. And that's I what, can't see his face. Oh, he's there, look, he's there. He's I just getting... But he's, he, his head's getting so big. His eyes is even getting stretched out. But you know, he just keeps doing it. No matter how many times people say to him, Billy, you can't boast like that there. He'll keep on doing it. And not only does Billy say he's best at football, he's, he's best at, what else? Eating. Eating. He's best at eating. <laughs> and drinking. And drinking. And what happens when he boasts about it? His, his head gets even bigger and bigger and bigger. And he's really good at, what else can we really good at? He's really good at, you've got a ruler, at jumping. He's the best at jumping. Billy's the best jumper and he loves telling people he's the best at jumping. And what happens when he boasts about being the best jumper? His head gets bigger. His head gets bigger. Oh. How big do you think we can blow his head off? And you know what happens? We'll not, we'll not blow it anymore just in case it does explode in my face. But it's not good, sure it's not. It's not good to keep boasting about things because that's not what the Bible tells us. That bit of the Bible that we read together there today talks about Jesus and it talks about us behaving like Jesus. And it tells us a wee bit about what Jesus was like. And it talks about him being humble talks about him considering other people better than ourselves. We've talked a lot about that over the past few few weeks, haven't we? That we have to think about other people rather than ourselves because when we think about ourselves and nothing but ourselves, our head just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's not how it's meant to be because it doesn't do us any good, sure it doesn't. Oh, yeah. Just summed it up. Full of hot air. We can be full of hot air sometimes. But Jesus wants us to be like him. To think about other people. Not to puff ourselves all up. But to encourage other people. To make them think they're better. To make them feel more important. Not talk about our own self-importance all the time. I know that would never happen to you at your age. But as you get older like some of us. It's very easy to do. And we have to think about it as well. Don't be all puffed up. Think about other people. And share your birthday cake with the minister. That's a good way. That's a good way. No, it's not. That's a, it's a good way. Think of other people before ourselves. Let's, let's have a wee word of prayer together. Then we're going we're gonna to sing and we're going to sing about how much Jesus loves us in, in our song together. So let's, let's give thanks to God. Uh, for Jesus. Father, we thank you today once again for Jesus. Father, we thank you that you loved us so much. You sent Jesus into this world, Lord, to, to live life to the full, to live life as you would want us to live life. Father, we thank you for the example that he has set us. And Lord, we pray that you would help us, both young and old, to live up to that example. Lord, help us not to be like Billy and blow ourselves up and boast about ourselves and about how wonderful we are. But help us to encourage other people. Help us to love other people. Help us to, to consider other people before ourselves. Lord, we know it's not an easy thing to do, but it is what you call us to do. So will you help us once again, we pray, or we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing.
we'll just stay here and sing as well because I have to turn around and look at the words as well. But we have no accents. Are the words up there yet, are they? Yes. They are. What do the words say? We don't need the words, do we? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. No? Is that not what it says? We'll all stand and let's sing together. your seats now yeah yep don't forget your butterfly as the the children go back to their seats we're going to continue uh, as always in our worship of God uh, as we come to our our morning offering so your morning offering I will now uh, be received Let's just pray together as we give thanks uh, for this offering. Father, we thank you for this opportunity as part of our worship, Lord, to pause and to come with thankful hearts and to bring uh, this offering to you here today. Lord, we thank you for uh, the ability uh, that we have uh, to come and and to give our offering to you. And Lord, we pray that you would accept this offering, that you would use it. Lord, bless it, use it, and use us for the extension of your kingdom and for your glory. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
just continue in that attitude of prayerfulness as we take time uh, to pray for others and, of course, as the Lord leads you, bring uh, the different situations that uh, you know of uh, that he has laid in your hearts to him. But please allow me uh, to lead you in a time of prayer for others. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, once again for this wonderful opportunity of prayer, Lord, this amazing opportunity to come uh, before your throne, Lord, and to bring... Uh, our requests, our burdens, or those things that we carry day by day, Lord, that weigh us down, and Lord, to know that we can come uh, to you and to bring them to you, and Lord, have that, that weight lifted, knowing we come to a God who does love us and does care for us, and Lord, doesn't want us to see, doesn't want to see us carrying that burden. And so we take uh, that opportunity now, and Lord, we want to pray for Lord, those around us, we want to pray for those around us who are struggling in many different ways. Lord, you know, within our fellowship and within our families, there are many who, yes, struggle physically, struggling emotionally, and yes, those who struggle spiritually. We want to pray for those who, Lord, we know who are housebound or who are in care homes, those who don't get out and about as much as they used to or would like to. I want to pray for those who are maybe lonely in those circumstances that they find themselves. I want to pray for those who will be listening to this service on CD or on the internet. Lord, we pray that whatever the circumstance is which has kept folk from joining with us in worship here today, Lord, we pray that they would know something of of your healing hand into their situation. We pray that they would know uh, your blessing and your help in the midst of their particular trial or, or difficulty. Lord, we want to take time today to to pray for our brothers and sisters across the world, Lord, who are those who don't have the same freedom to, to meet as we do. They don't have the same privilege to worship so openly and listen to your word as, as we do here. Lord, we can't even begin to imagine the, the fear and the difficulty that they face just to, to come together as your people. But we want to pray for them today. We want to pray that they would be built up in their faith. We want to pray that they would be strengthened in their relationship with you. We want to pray that they would be empowered to, to stand firm for what they believe. And that through that, that in their love for you, others might see something of your amazing grace and see something of your outstanding glory through them. And Father, what we pray for them, we we pray for ourselves as well. Or we face maybe a very different situation, but we, we do, we see opposition to our faith growing every day in this country. We see a rejection of the truth of your word and of your gospel. Or as people are convicted of their sin and their lifestyle, Lord, we see that backlash. Lord, we see it especially in our society at the moment with things like abortion and the push for same-sex marriage and all those different issues. But Lord, we pray that as those people hear your word, as they hear your truth and as they are convicted of their sin that your spirit would work mightily, would bring them not just to that place of conviction, but to that place of confession and repentance. Lord, we pray that in all things and in every aspect of our lives, or the same as we prayed for our brothers and sisters across the world, we pray that all our lives, both personal and as as a corporate body, as your people, as your family here, we might 
we may too be empowered to shine for Jesus into our world. Lord, we pray that we would be that, that light into a world which is getting darker day by day. Lord, we pray for our country as it certainly does seem to be getting darker and darker day by day. We pray for our governments. Our dear word calls us to pray for our leaders. Or we pray that they would come to some sort of sense and Lord would turn to you for your wisdom, for your leading and your guiding rather than well, what in essence is the minority in the world. Lord, we pray for the elections coming up and we pray that or many of the things that have been yeah, many of the things that have been promised and many a manifesto, Lord, wouldn't come to fruition. We pray for the protection of the unborn in our society. Lord, we pray that these laws which have been forced upon us, Lord, could be repealed or that something could be done. Or to bring our country back into line with you and, and your word. And Father, in all things, we pray that you would help us. Help us to be the followers and disciples that you call us to be. Help us to live out what we say we believe. And help us to take our stand. Or to make our voice heard that others might hear your voice through ours. And Father, we thank you for this time of prayer once again. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to bring these different situations to you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to bring those people that you have brought to our hearts and our minds to you in prayer here. So Lord, we pray that you would help us to, to leave it all with you in your more than capable hands as we come and we leave them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to turn to God's word uh, together now, we're going to stand, we're going to sing our next piece of praise on your screen. There is a higher throne. Let's stand and let's worship God together.
I remember saying at the, the start of this series that we were looking at this letter of Paul's uh, to the church in Philippi because it has that great mixture of, of, of joy, of, of encouragement, uh, but of course of challenge uh, as well. Even though it is the, the epistle of joy, uh, Paul doesn't let us off the hook uh, about our behavior and our attitude uh, to a lot of things, especially uh, as we've heard uh, in our attitude to, to each other. If I were to ask you to, to pick a single passage which covers all of those things, there probably could be no better passage than that wonderful and inspiring one that we read earlier on, and one that's often called the, uh, the Christological hymn because many people believe it was, was sung as a hymn by the early churches because it contains so much theological truth about Jesus. It leads us right through his life from him descending to this earth to walk amongst us, right through his journey to the cross and and on to his ascension and glorification at the right hand of God. All of that summed up in a mere seven verses of Scripture. But what a glorious seven verses they are. So far, Paul has focused a lot on the whole topic of of unity, both inside and outside the church. At the heart of the the last couple of messages have, what has been this, the effect our witness uh, has on how we affect, uh, how we act towards those outside the church, and of course, how we deal with each other and and our differences uh, with one another inside the fellowship of believers. The messages so far have all been about be the need to be to be like minded, to be lowly minded, to consider others better than ourselves. But of course, all the time striving together with one purpose for the glory of the gospel. And now he takes us a step further. That theme of, of, of unity that he's been talking about surely reaches a, a, a wonderful crescendo here. Paul has been building and building and building on this importance, the importance of of unity in every aspect of our lives. And now you can almost almost hear him bursting into song as he takes takes us to what is really at the core of it all. Turns our attention to how we can actually accomplish all of this with one simple solution the need to concentrate on the mind. But not just any mind. The mind of Christ Jesus. Because you see, as much as this passage is, well, it's a theological masterpiece. As much as it is that, and even with all the wonderful truths it gives us about Jesus, Paul's purpose in retelling this drama isn't so that we can learn more facts about Jesus' divinity and so on. Although that's an important part of it. It's not simply to stir our imaginations with awe and wonder. Although that's part of it as well. Paul writes this amazing Christological feast because he is concerned about unity. He's concerned about how easily we see disunity sneak in among the people of God. And it sneaks in because they are are more motivated and more focused on on what's going on in the world around them and being impacted by it rather than God's word. Yes, it's full of deep theological truths about Jesus. And of course we do well to remember those truths and the significance of everything that's in those verses to help us guard against error. But that's not why Paul writes it here. He has a much simpler purpose in mind. He uses it as a way to to help us look at things differently as we face those challenges and uh, and trials in life that threaten to, to thwart our efforts to stand together as God's people. Especially, as we say, as we find ourselves in the midst of an unbelieving and and certainly an unsympathetic society. And amidst the 
the tensions that, that, that arise in the fellowship when our, our individual preferences and priorities collide with each other. Paul wants us to look at things differently. If you can imagine this passage being like a... If it would come up. If you can imagine this passage being like, like an old antique mirror in the shop. Lots of people will come in and they will admire and appreciate its beauty. Lots of people will come in and they will admire its value as well. But that's not what it's intended for. It has a much simpler primary purpose, doesn't it? It has a very practical purpose. It's made so that someone can look at themselves in it and change and improve themselves. It's not there because it looks nice. It's there for us to look in and to change our appearance. And it's exactly the same with this passage of Scripture. Of course, we can stand back and marvel at it as we read it. Of course, we can admire the beauty of it. But its primary purpose is so that we can look at ourselves through it. So that we can look at our attitudes through it and be changed and improved by it. The book of Philippians is one of the few books in the Bible that gives us a real glimpse into Jesus' mind. And this is the classic passage which allows us, in some sense, to gaze into the mind of our Savior and be changed and transformed as we see the example that he has set for us. We talk very easily about being changed and renewed to become more and more like Jesus, don't we? But if it really is our desire to eliminate those attitudes of of selfish ambition and vain conceit that Paul has already highlighted, attitudes that were rife in the church in Philippi and of course still are in many churches today, then this is the example that we need to look to for that attitude adjustment that that we so desperately need. Now, before we look at some of the aspects of this attitude or mindset uh, that we're being encouraged to to emulate, there is just one quick point, or or more specifically, a word that's well worth noting. And you'll know I'm into single words. But there's one word that's worth noting and keeping in our minds uh, as we see what Paul is calling us to here. And again, it it highlights the essence of of unity that's really concerning Paul here. This is another one of those times when translation to English sometimes can lose the original significance. We read it earlier where Paul says, "Your your attitude should be like that of Christ Jesus. But the your, the your is plural. It's not just about me. It's the royal we, as the saying goes. We could read this very individually, and of course, each and every individual who knows and loves Jesus is called to to constantly assess and reassess our attitudes. We are constantly called to, to grow more and more like Jesus each day. We are to continue to be shaped and molded more and more like him each day. But this, This has the spirit of community about it. This is about us. It has the essence of of working together, of helping each other, of growing together. It's, It's our mindset. Collectively, as God's people, as a fellowship. You're, our, we, our attitude. Attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. We all know it, don't we? To get the best out of any community, you obviously have to work together. And so to get the best out of the Christian community, Paul says everyone has to work together with the same sacrificial mindset as Christ Jesus. So as we look at the distinctive motives in Jesus' mindset that Paul sets out for us here, keep that 
that sense of community. Keep that sense of the overall well-being of everyone, of the fellowship in mind as well. And as I was thinking about this, uh, it kind of reminded me of a scene from the film Hot Fuzz, if you've ever seen it. Anybody ever seen it? Nobody going to admit to it? Nobody. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. It's one of those comedy films that's supposed to be a spoof drama. Uh, It's about the life of a, a big city policeman who finds himself transferred to this small, sleepy country village. Um... Many people, of course, find the film funny because some of the things the police do in the film um, seem so ridiculous that you have to laugh at them. Unfortunately, coming from my background, I find it funny because I know many of those ridiculous things actually happen um, and could happen. But anyway, in the film, the main character, Sergeant Angel, um, takes on the local neighborhood Watch Alliance who have become almost like a a law unto themselves in the village. They run the whole show. Uh, And why does that remind me of this passage? Well, the core purpose of this neighborhood watch is for the greater good. That's their catchphrase, for the greater good of the entire village. And at all of their meetings, every time one of the members says, for the greater good, they all join together and say, for the greater good. There's that sense of, of togetherness. Now, of course, in the film, the core purpose and the mindset of the people in the neighborhood watch has been twisted in a sense. But that's the kind of mindset that Paul is calling us to. A mindset for the greater good of the community, of the fellowship, and the good of the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So, the question, what is at the heart of this mindset? Well, three simple things, really. My apologies, this is the first time I've used the wee clicker. <laughs> By the time we get back into the church, it might be, it might be flowing a bit better. <clears throat> three simple things, you see them there. Humility, servanthood, and obedience. Three things we talk about very easily. Certainly humility and servanthood are a couple of things that we talk a lot about. But in reality, wouldn't it be true to say there are things that we don't grow in as much as we would like, or certainly as much as we should. But here we have Jesus in our passage. Instead of holding on to what was rightfully his, he lays it all aside to become a man. Instead of holding on to all the power and the honor and the glory that is rightfully his in heaven, he comes down to earth as a man to walk amongst us and to give his life for us. Do you not find that mind-blowing? That Jesus gave up all of that just for you and for me. There's no question that he fulfilled what Paul has called us to do. In humility to consider others better than ourselves. Jesus gave up everything that his place and position granted him in heaven for the greater good of everyone except himself. So friends, if he, the almighty God, would and did stoop voluntarily in such humility to lower himself to what Paul refers to as as a bondservant, the lowest of the low, the servant who was bound to serve for no wages or anything, servant who was there just to serve others for no gain for themselves. If Jesus could humble himself to that level, then how much more should we? The pardoned, the redeemed, the rebels who have been saved behave towards God and behave towards each other with that same humble spirit. The key to how he was willing and able to do that, simple. Obedience, the third one. His ultimate motivation 
was simply obedience to his father's will. He knew what the call of God was in his life and he followed it to the letter. As far as being obedient to the the point of the most excruciating death on the cross as he sacrificed himself for our sins, he was obedient to his father. There's the challenge for us, isn't it? We all know from God's word what he expects of us. We all know that we're called or what we're called to be and what we're called to do as his disciples in this our time and generation. We all know about that call of humility and of unity. We all know we're expected to consider others better than ourselves. But the challenge is in our obedience to it, isn't it? And of course we can't and we won't live up to that all the time. That's the difference between Jesus' example and the reality for us. But it certainly shouldn't stop us trying, should it? You and I can't and never will live up to the standard that Jesus sets for us. But he knows that. And he still sets the goal for us. He calls us to be humble. He calls us to be obedient. He calls us to have that servant heart just like him. To consider others before we consider ourselves. So really the bottom line, the call from this passage is that we need to get ourselves the Jesus attitude. We need to be humble. We need to be servant hearted. We need to be obedient to God's commands and what he calls us to be. That's the call of the passage. And to close it off as if that wasn't challenge enough. Paul draws the the hymn to a close. He leaves us with one of the most beautiful verses, I think, in Scripture. Yet one that gives us a stark reminder about the future. I love the closing verses of the hymn because it conjures up this, this beautiful scene, in my mind anyway, of that great day when all who have trusted and believed in Jesus will bow down and worship him face to face. But as lovely an image as that portrays. It's also a reminder to each and every one of us that that a day will come. And that day is coming when we will have to stand before God. And that's what Paul's reminding us of here. That one day we will all bow before Jesus. Every single one of us will know for certain that Jesus is Lord, without exception. But on that wonderful and terrible day, both believers and unbelievers will bend the knee and confess who Jesus really is. A wonderful day, of course, for those of us who have trusted and believed in Jesus but a terrible day as well because unfortunately for many, Scripture is quite clear there too. On that day, for many, Scripture says it will be too late. For many, the recognition that Jesus as Lord will be a sorrowful one. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. There's still the opportunity to look into that mirror of God's word and to change. I called William Sangster, a Methodist minister in London during the, the Second World War, I think summed up these verses very succinctly. He says, if we follow Jesus' example, the only way up is down. If we want to join that great chorus of disciples at the end of time, if we want to be part of that heavenly choir, 
then we have to get down first. First and foremost, we get down on our knees and we seek God's forgiveness. Then in response to that, we live in obedience and seek to humbly serve God and each other until that great day comes when Jesus returns and we all join him in glory. Friend, do you want to go up? When that day comes, do you want to go up? Well, then you've got to go down first. You can do that today. After this service, we take a time of, of fellowship together over a cup of tea. And I'm more than happy to forgo my cup of coffee. And I'm sure any of the elders would be too if you want to come and talk to us. Today could be the day. Let me pray with you. Let's pray. (laughs) Father, we thank you for this wonderful passage of Scripture that gives us a glimpse into Jesus' mind. Gives us a glimpse into his attitude and character of humility, of servanthood, of obedience to you. And yes, when we look at that passage and we look at it in a a mirror as such and look at ourselves in light of it, or we recognize, yes, how far short we fall. Lord, we thank you that you've opened opened up that way for us to Yeah, get down on our knees even today to come to you, to ask for your forgiveness and to turn away from our sinful ways, to repent and to be saved. And Lord, we do, we pray for anyone who finds themselves in that place today, Lord, that you would speak to them or draw them to yourself that Yes, one, they might know the joy of that relationship with you today. But they would also know that eternal assurance, security of their place in that heavenly choir at the end of time. So, Father, speak to us. Each one we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was going to say we're going to sing the last hymn together, but I had to make sure I got it right first. And we're going to stand, we're going to sing our last mind, of course, that wonderful hymn that reminds us of this. May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day. Let's stand.
Let's pray uh, as we finish. Father, we do pray that as we leave this place, as we onward go, as the hymn says, as we go on our way, Lord, we pray that our focus would be completely uh, on Jesus. We pray that the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would be with each of us now and forevermore. Amen.